Hi, before we get into this video, you might want to pause and go grab yourself your favourite drink and your favourite snack and settle down because this is going to be a long ass bus ride, okay? Right. Before anyone in Europe had even heard of a new coronavirus being called Wuhan flu, Singapore was second only to China in new infections. And then Singapore tumbled down that particular league table as other countries started to overtake. How did Singapore manage this? What caused a surge of cases for Singapore in April? And at a time when it seems to be ravaging the rest of the world, what more can your country do to flatten your own curve? All this and more on this lockdown edition of Scott and the Dot. The Wuhan flu, the CCP virus, COVID-19, the official name given by the World Health Organization after being coerced into changing the name in order to stop discussion of where it originated. Whatever you want to call it, it's here and it can be fucking deadly. Don't be fooled by the flu-like symptoms. Coronaviruses by their very nature are not the flu. It's a highly infectious lung disease, a deadly form of pneumonia. Before I get into how good Singapore's initial response was, let's have a quick recap of just how we ended up here. And I'm going to stick to the facts, facts and current circumstantial evidence, which may be subject to change at a future time as the situation is still more fluid than chocolate left out in 30 degree sunlight. This is not the first time Singapore has borne the brunt of a disease outbreak from China. Back in 2003, SARS was a thing. Remember that? If, like myself, you lived in the UK at the time, you'll know that Britain was barely touched by SARS. So much so, only four confirmed cases were ever found, with zero fatalities back then. In Singapore, however, it was a different scenario. The Lion City had 238 cases, killed 33, leaving the island nation shell-shocked from how this could happen. Now, I was going to make this a Singapore versus UK virus response video, but to be honest, the responses from places like the UK and the US have shown to be so bad that there really is no comparison at all. But Mark, what about the huge spike in cases in Singapore in April? Well, don't you worry, I'll be getting to that a bit later on. You just need to wait your damn turn. Pass over 17 years since the outbreak of SARS, in fact, exactly 17 years to the month, cases of, as it was called back then, Wuhan flu, started being reported in local hospitals there in early November 2019. Doctors trying to warn relatives on WeChat were arrested for spreading rumours and forced them to sign confessions stating they were being misleading. News was suppressed in mainland China and the world for almost two full months while the outbreak ran rampant and unchecked. Russia closed its massive two and a half thousand mile land border in early January. Back then, we were all thinking someone ate bat soup that wasn't cooked properly. But the fact is, the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party, also known as the CCP, has never shared with the rest of the world information regarding how this disease originated. What we do know is Western doctors, having reverse engineered this rampant plague, have confirmed it is indeed a coronavirus housed by bats. At one stage, it was thought it may have jumped to pangolins, also endangered and also considered an exotic delicacy in China, before jumping to humans, but we've yet to see hard evidence of this. There is the patient zero theory. There is a virus investigating laboratory less than 300 metres from the wet market in Wuhan, where the first recognised infection cluster originated. On the lab website, there is a list of staff, past and present, some of them are still working there, some have moved on to other places as stated on the website, except for one. There's no photo there in the placeholder, there's no information regarding where she has worked since November 19, 2019. Sorry. And she was a specialist in bat coronaviruses. Now obviously, due to lack of any kind of confirmation from the CCP, I can't state for sure that this doctor may have contracted COVID from live samples in the laboratory. She may have lived her life asymptomatic, not showing any symptoms. Perhaps she shopped at, at the, the wet market nearby. Possibly she has since passed away as 
patient zero from COVID, unwittingly sparking the most worst global pandemic since Spanish flu in the early 20th century. This theory has been covered comprehensively by better creators than me. In particular, I can recommend this video by Lawai86. He's an American who lived 10 years in China until relatively recently, relocating to California in the past year. This guy knows his stuff. He knows Mandarin. He knows how to search for public domain information like this in Chinese, including finding out that the three state-run telco companies in China had reported an unprecedented 21 million customers drop off their network in the first three months of 2020. No reason has been given for these publicly released figures. Now, I cannot say with any authority that 21 million people in China died from the CCP virus, but I also cannot say with any conviction either that they haven't. Okay? For more background information and insights on what really goes on behind the Great Firewall of China, CCP tactics on skewing narratives and so much more, I urge you to follow these channels, Loai86, his friend Serpent ZA, their joint channel ADV China, and also Chris Chappell's China Uncensored. They explain things far better than I ever could. Singapore confirmed their first case of the novel coronavirus on January 23rd, 2020. It was brought to Singapore by a visiting tour group from Wuhan. At this point, news was only very slowly trickling out of a potential new strain of a SARS-related illness called the Wuhan virus at the time. Remember, at this point, the only country to have closed its borders to Chinese incomers was Russia. Hong Kong and Taiwan quickly followed. By this point, Taiwan had even alerted the World Health Organization that they had confirmed human-to-human -human transmission, only to be roundly ignored. Why? Because the CCP were pressuring the WHO to accept their narrative only, and Taiwan being disputed territory is considered part of China by the CCP. A kind of, don't listen to some small offshore part of China, listen to the official government information kind of thing. The United Nations, overseer of the WHO, also struggled to recognise Taiwan as independent under CCP pressure. It's a situation which is royally fucked up, just so the CCP can save face with the world and the Chinese people they rule over. But I digress. January 23rd was also the day Wuhan and large parts of Hubei province were to be locked down for 76 days, only recently reopened. The CCP had refused to stop travel at the busiest time in the Chinese calendar, Chinese New Year's, the Year of the Rat. It was estimated that 7 million visitors of Chinese ethnicity would come home for their traditional reunion dinners at the time, and the majority population of Singapore is Chinese, 75%. From the very first case confirmation, Singapore's pandemic response, fashioned since being hit by SARS 17 years earlier, was swift to flatten the curve. Singapore has employed the tactics of stringent temperature scanning for incomers and at major shopping malls, aggressive contact tracing, informing, testing, isolation and release. And they've been totally transparent about it. Even on nightly state news, there is an update of new infections, how these new infections connect to already identified virus clusters, or if they're not connected at all. Usually imported cases from Singaporean citizens returning to the country. In fact, one account I remember reading about, a British citizen was called up by a representative of Singapore's Ministry of Health. She was asked, can you confirm you took a grab taxi on Wednesday night at 6.07pm for seven minutes? She couldn't really remember how to confirm it, as it had been two days previously. But the MOH had gotten her details from the Grab app she had used to book the cab to track her down. So, after a bit of memory jogging, she confirmed that she had indeed been in a cab at that time two days earlier. The officer on the other end of the phone call issued her with a compulsory stay-home notice effective immediately, a 14-day self-quarantine, self-isolation, and informed her that someone had tested positive in that cab earlier that day. She was not told if it was a cab driver or a previous passenger or what, but it was a close shave indeed, as she consistently tested negative for COVID-19 throughout that 14-day period. These actions started, as I said, from the very first confirmed case, along with advisories about hygiene, thorough sort of hand washing or sanitising, sensible advice regarding social distancing, only wearing a mask if you are sick, etc., have all contributed to keeping the influx of new infections at a manageable rate, and it did. 
for two months. But we'll get to that. At one point, Singapore was second only to China for infection rates. So why was Singapore one of the first beyond China to be affected? Well, one reason is that there were direct flights operating between Wuhan and Singapore at the time. Singapore being arguably the biggest travel hub in Southeast Asia was always going to be one of the first in line, the line of fire, and always going to be the conduit by which an outbreak was going to reach the rest of the world. In fact, the first cases in Europe and the UK came via a so-called super spreader, businessman from Brighton on the south coast of England, and home to such YouTube luminaries as PewDiePie, Jacksepticeye, and a few others. He had attended a function at the Grand Hyatt Hotel in central Singapore, where he became unknowingly infected before flying on to Paris and then home to Brighton, infecting others along the way. But wait a minute, Mark, I hear you say. How on earth can an ordinary Joe Blow like you know all this? Well, as mentioned already, contact tracing meant that Singapore traced and tracked everyone who attended the Grand Hyatt function. And so, of course, where all these people had gone on from there. Now, allow me to diverge for a moment. Before I came to Singapore, and considering myself reasonably politically aware, I was honestly a little worried that the ruling government, the People's Action Party, also known as the PAP, before, uh, who have been in power, sorry, before Singapore became independent of Malaysia in 1965, was a bit like a velvet dictatorship, a bit like a diet Chinese Communist Party, if you will. But having been here for over a year, I've come to realise the PAP are actually a lot better than I first gave them credit for. Instead of being dictatorial, they are more like the government mainland China could have had were it not for the self-serving, face-saving forms of corruption that beset the CCP with problems from the top down. Instead, they seem to be more benign, more for the people than for themselves. Probably the most nannied state on earth. Now please, don't get me wrong, I am no PAP kiss-ass, okay? I am not, this video isn't sponsored by the PAP, I am not some government shill. If I was, I'd make damn sure I was being well fucking paid for it, okay? Instead, because I, addressing the matter of the coronavirus is more than a passing mention, will result in this video getting demonetised straight away, or perhaps even taken down soon. So, I'm not going to make a penny for any of this. That way though, you can know that I can be as honest as fuck about it, with no sponsorship causing any kind of conflict of interest whatsoever. But, I have been really impressed with Singapore's initial swift reaction to the outbreak, dealt with with a transparency that was sorely lacking in the leadership of mainland China. So, what in the hell went wrong with Europe? Europe, by contrast, was slow to react. While Singapore was already temperature testing anyone who was entering the country, smugness across Europe, a sort of It'll never happen here, or it's only a flu. That kind of attitude permeates throughout, from Turkey in the east to the UK in the west. Soccer and other major sports and live events were being cancelled across the continent. Proof, if any were needed, that we were dealing with something pretty serious. Tens of thousands of infections exploded in Italy in a matter of three weeks, and the UK was projecting just two weeks behind them. I have not even mentioned the USA yet, Christ, nor will I, right? This video is not about the US response to the outbreak. Please, for the love of all that is holy or precious in your life, do not inject yourselves with fucking disinfectant. Unless your name is Trump, or you wholeheartedly believe President number 45 100%, then be my fucking guest. I don't care. Part of the reason why Europe's infection figures and the US seemed to be so explosive compared to, for example, even mainland China, could be deliberate misinformation from the Chinese government, playing down the numbers of infected and fatalities deliberately. Circumstantial evidence suggests that official CCP statements regarding numbers of infected and deaths could be being underrepresented by between 10 and 100 times. Personal on-the-ground accounts that leaked out beyond China early on in this outbreak suggest that mortuaries and crematoria are having to operate 24 hours a day to deal with demand. 
people collapsing in the streets, either dead or from exhaustion from the Wuhan virus illness. These are scenes we have seen repeated in Italy. Infected being forcibly removed from their homes by authoritarian figures in full hazmat PPE and loaded screaming into the back of vans and others being welded into their homes as part of the 76 day lockdown of Wuhan. But I'm getting off the point again, aren't I? <coughs> all in all, it was a lack of taking this highly infectious form of pneumonia seriously, complacency, and a lack of launching contingent measures to combat the spread quickly enough, negligence, that has led to the current situation on both sides of the Atlantic right now. This section is going to be a bit contentious, mainly because things that were or weren't enacted at certain points were based on the given information at the time. As we know, information from the origin country wasn't always complete, transparent or even forthcoming so far, and as such, the PAP cannot seriously take all the blame. I think I've established who I think is to blame for the CCP virus, but here are the things I personally think, in my opinion, Singapore could have done a whole lot better and would do well to implement the next time there's an infectious outbreak. Number one, not temperature scanning transient passengers. Temperature scanning was set up at immigration throughout Singapore from the first confirmed case. However, not scanning transient passengers, the ones who use Singapore as a layover to change flights, to go to other destinations, just passing through, is just begging for any pandemic to spread to the rest of the world, with Changi Airport being such a major transport hub. Direct flights between destinations in China and Singapore are always going to leave the nation state vulnerable, not just to being one of the first outside China to get infection clusters, but also for those infection clusters to then pass on to the rest of the world. Singapore has a responsibility to be the best it can be at disease control airside as it's the front line before going anywhere else, especially when China can't themselves be trusted with figures. Two, wholesale testing. Singapore didn't know it at the time, but it would have benefited from testing everyone. Everyone? What do you mean everyone? EVERYONE! Wholesale testing is something South Korea did, and as it proved useful in catching those with no symptoms of the CCP virus and flattening their own curve. I can't lay blame with the government for this point either, as they acted on the given lacking information of the time. 3. Mask wearing While well, most of Asia was getting masked up in January, Singapore took a different and understandable tact. Wear a mask only if you are sick, although Southeast Asian nations were horrified by this. But it was to try to prevent panic buying of masks. Spoiler alert, it didn't and leave masks for those frontline heroes who needed them. Hospital staff, taxi and bus drivers, supermarket staff, food delivery drivers, and of course, bubble tea sellers. Again, they did what they thought was right at the time. Point number four, not protecting the migrant worker dormitories. And so we sadly come to the nitty gritty. This is the one point that breaks my heart to say. The one precaution the PAP seemingly forgot to take, protecting the dormitory accommodations of the migrant workers. Singapore lives and breathes and its heart beats due to migrant workers, whether in construction, cleaning and sanitary, and probably to a lesser extent in dormitories, domestic helpers. COVID-19 was in Singapore for the whole of February and March before an explosion of confirmed cases among the migrant dorm population was detected, soaring the number of cases to just by 10 times in just four short weeks. This cluster now accounts for 80% of Singapore's now 12,000 plus cases at the time of recording. And there is no other way to put it, but the blame must lie squarely at the feet of the PAP for failing to stop what was an inevitable but ultimately preventable surge in cases. There's a motto the PAP like to ring out from time to time. One nation, one people, one Singapore. COVID-19 ravaging the migrant, ravaging the migrant dorms showed we're not all one as much as the government like to tell as we are, and is potentially indicative of an underlying bias against migrant workers by the population. Even Professor Tommy Coe is quoted as saying that Singapore is a first world nation with third world attitudes at times. 
Now, I reiterate, this entire video is one long opinion piece, essentially. But it saddens me greatly that all the good work the PAP did to protect the rest of us from this outbreak somehow forgot to extend to the migrant workforce. Whenever there is another outbreak, and there will be one someday as long as the CCP is in power in China, I hope this thing never happens again. Well, geez, that was one long ass video, wasn't it? I do hope you managed to stay till the end. If you did, give me a thumbs up and comment I'm a brave soul in the comments below. If you watched and didn't like it, give me a thumbs down, all's fair after all. If you loved what you just endured, be sure to subscribe. And if you hated it, well, you know what to do by now. Hashtag ring a ding dong that gosh darn bell. And it's, you, you can hate the next video as soon as it comes out. For me and my loved ones, to you and yours, use fucking soap and water to wash your hands thoroughly if you've been outside. Observe the restrictions in your area. Try to stay home as much as humanly possible and stay safe so you can watch more of my videos. Stay home, save lives, you groovy motherfucker. Till next time, Scott the Daughters and Sons, see you then, have a nice and safe Ramadan.